Hello and welcome to the third Zero Emissions Byron webinar series on electric vehicles. I'm Mick O'Regan and it's my great pleasure to be the host of this third, third of eight webinars that we'll be doing looking at the issues around electric vehicles in Australia. To begin, however, I want to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the place where I am tonight in the hinterland of Cape Byron. Uh, it's uh, Bunjalung country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This evening, as I said, in webinar number three, we're calling it Charging Ahead Electric Vehicles. And we're going to consider some of the issues around the ideas of charging EVs, what it means to the way we use vehicles, what it means to our electricity grid, and what it means to the renewable energy and electric electrification of transport. Happily, we're joined by two experts in the field, and it's a great pleasure to welcome them now. Josh Harvey is from Essential Energy. Welcome to you, Josh. And also Susanna Barbier is from the NRMA. Look, we're going to get straight into it. And Josh, I'm going to ask you to begin by giving me an overview of Essential Energy's interest in the area of electric vehicles and the issues around charging. Thanks, Mick. Um, I'll steal the screen if I may, and just let me know if you can see the, the presentation. So it's great pleasure to be able to present tonight's event. Um, Essential Energy, as you may may or may not know, is is one of the key um, energy distribution um, companies within New South Wales. We actually. Um, deliver energy to 95% of New South Wales geographic mass and have about 200 square kilometres of uh, poles and wires that, that support all of our customers in rural New South Wales. Um, from an energy supply chain, we're one of, of a number of companies that help to um, provide the energy and electricity that, that turns on lights and energises cars in the future. Um, obviously, you've got generators, so think of Origin or AGL, transmission, which are the larger wires, ourselves, which are the vast majority of the poles and wires that you'll see in New South Wales, retailers, customers, and then service providers. Service providers are a, a newer agent in our distribution chain, but we think are, are equally, if not more important going forward, as they're the, the agents which will provide additional services as we move forward. A little bit about Essential Energy. We, um, we cover about 200,000 square kilometers of, of, of um, line. We service around 840,000 customers um, and, and our entire responsibility is, is making sure that electricity is flowing throughout New South Wales seamlessly um, and that we're, we're making sure that we're providing an infrastructure to New South Wales that powers today and enables tomorrow. One of the fundamental things that we're actually seeing in the industry though on an electrical vehicles is one of those catalysts is that the way we live our lives is substantially changing we're moving from a, an environment where once we had central generation um, we had um, app appliances in our homes that we turned on and off and we got a bill once every three months to a engaged very smart infrastructure and, and customer base that really is able to dictate how, when and, and what they're using to electrify their future going forward, whether it be it smartphones, smart appliances, the um, generation no longer from a central point, but actually from the rooftops that we have through to smart appliances and peer-to-peer -peer trading. All of these items are part and parcel of smart communities, smart homes in the future. And part of what we need to do is, is make sure that we're providing the infrastructure and facilitation that makes engaging in that new future as easy as humanly possible. So how do we do that? Part of that is, is 
through engaging with large scale embedded generation. So I think large solar farms, we have many, some in Forbes, some in parks, um, across our footprint. We wanna make sure that we're providing the right um, signals for our customers to be able to, to engage and use electricity in a smart and appropriate fashion. We wanna make sure that driving or procuring an electric vehicle is effortless with regards to maintenance and charging. And then we wanna make sure that we've got the appropriate technology supporting customers going forward. And that might be through using microgrids, standalone power systems, or as simple as being able to leverage your smartphone to be able to get every bit of information and make informed and accurate decisions as we go forward. Why do we want to do that? Well, we've got a really simple vision, which is empowering communities to share and use energy for a better tomorrow. The compelling thing here is, is that we see that country New South Wales is a community that will be an engine room for New South Wales going forward. And there's no better reason than for an engine room to have a smart, reliable network that allows it to power for the future. I suppose one of the compelling things is, is if you, you know, look at where our industry is going, a large portion of generation in New South Wales is actually in the, on top of homes and businesses in country New South Wales. We're looking at being able to actually generate around one gigawatt of energy in New South Wales on, on rooftops, in homes and, and on top of businesses. And what a wonderful way of being able to start to produce and consume locally. The interesting thing, especially around, um, around where this takes us is, is it actually introduces a whole new way of being able to manage the grid. If you look at this, um, this graph and, and excuse the, the technology speak here, but not too long ago, we had a largely a flat curve. As we started to introduce rooftop solar and generation, what you started to see is substantial peakiness in, in, in where generation is sitting. So we're starting to get larger humps in the morning and then during the middle of the day, consumption drops off and then it's a larger lump at night when the sun goes down. Now, the interesting thing with this is, is that as we start to see um, charging infrastructure come in, um, you're starting to also see load curves change. So where before we used to have pretty flat curves from a, a consumer and industry focus in, in large, fast charging infrastructure for EVs, it's very, very peaky. And when I say peaky, what you'll see here is, you'll see here on the right hand side, the graph is rather flat. Whereas with fast charging, what you'll see is large lumps and then it goes down, large lumps and it goes down. So from an importance from an infrastructure provider, what you're starting to see is, is that we'll have peaks where we need to supply lots of infrastructure and then it goes and reduces down to a flat line and then peak again. So you've got large areas where we've actually got gaps. That brings a problem in, in that from an infrastructure point of view, where you'll see traditional loads where we'll plan out our infrastructure to avoid those um, peaks and have start flat lines where we're using the assets and the investment that New South Wales has made to, um, to support generation. Now what we're seeing is, is that you've got very large peaks, but then there's a lot of space where that asset isn't being utilized to actually support the infrastructure that's being provided. And you'll see this here. So you actually see the gap where you've got long average runs here versus short utilization. Now I think this is important because this really sits at the the fulcrum of, of where we're going as a company. What you'll hear us start to talk about is, is the curation of the network. 
And so what you'll see here is, is, is the charging infrastructure for destination charging. So this is charging that's on the side of a road, it's not in your house. The large peak of that is during the middle of the day. Strangely enough, what you actually see also, and I talked about that one gigawatt of generation that's sitting on people's houses and, and on people's businesses, the generation is also roughly in that same time frame. Why is that important? Well, what we see is, is that we, we need to actually start to enable and curate the generation that's happening on the low voltage network with the demand that's coming in from electric vehicles. To be able to do that, we actually move away from being a poles and wires company, uh, which, would, which largely was if there was a problem, we solved it with poles and wires, to very much being an organization that's engaged with our communities, understand what their needs are today and in, in the future, understand where markets may be generating energy and when and how markets may be consuming energy and making sure that those two parties are talking at any point in time and making sure that the consumption and transfer of that electricity is as seamless and easy as humanly possible. Um, it's not a easy topic, but it's one that we're very, very focused on because we believe that by doing this, we actually make sure that we're living up to the challenge we've made, which is, is to be able to provide an infrastructure that um, has an eye for the future and supports what our, our communities and customers need as we go forward. Part of doing this, and I'm so glad that Susan's here from NRMA, is, is Susanna's here from NRMA, is, is to ensure that we um, are supporting. Part of that is, is building out a, a community in electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging, making sure we have appropriate tariffs, making sure that connecting to our network is easy. And then last but not least, making sure that we've got the right communications happening at the right time, facilitating the right planning so that we've got the right infrastructure in place today and deploying the right infrastructure for tomorrow. And with that, I think that uh, there's a nice segue to Susanna to, to commence the great work that NRMA is doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Josh. That was um, a very comprehensive way to begin. And I'm going to play off your shoulder. And as you just said, this is an appropriate time to bring Susanna Barbier in from NRMA. Susanna, can we, can we get you to give the NRMA perspective in an overview initially? You sure can, and thank you. Thank you, Josh. And yes, it's actually lovely having you on a call. There's certainly a few innovative things we can work jointly together on moving forward. Um, let me get my presentation up. Sure, I'm sharing. And I'm assuming you can see the pack. All right. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you information about the NRMA EV charging network. So in terms of where we're at and where we're going. Uh, so the NRMA, um, well, it exists to support its members and the community and is committed to keeping people moving and delivering on our foundational purpose. So the NRMA, it turned 100 this year. It's grown in the last 100 years and has changed with the times. From humble beginnings back in the 1920s as a lobby group for better roads to allow for vehicle travel across New South Wales and the ACT in the days where potholes were, were bigger than cars, the NRMA has been helping shape change for our roads and transport. The NRMA has evolved into a leader in transport and tourism with over 2.6 million members. However, as times change, our values remain the same. We're committed to continually deliver on our foundational purpose, and that's to keep people moving. So from helping Australians transition from horse and cart to automobiles and navigating the challenges that have come with changes in transportation, 
to entering a new future of mobility, the NRMA has always championed the needs of motorists and kept people moving. And now the inevitable future of motoring, well, it's electric. So the NRMA is delivering on our purpose to make sure our members and their communities are ready for the future of transport. Now, as a mutual, the NRMA exists to add value to members in the community. So back in 2017, uh, through our social dividend investment strategy, the NRMA announced its commitment to invest $10 million of its members' funds to build Australia's largest electric vehicle fast charging network, which is to be suitable for a range of EVs and electric cars and for it to be free for all EV drivers. And we're delivering on this. We're working with communities to deliver the network. We're giving motorists choice in how they travel and to unlock regional destinations to the future of motoring. Supporting the uptake of electric vehicles in Australia is a key priority for the NRMA. And as more manufacturers and countries focus on electric vehicles in the future, and it gives communities choice, especially in regional New South Wales. We also understand that the NRMA can play a very important role in regional communities that are grappling with the recent drought, recovering from bushfires, and now with the impacts of the pandemic. Our investment in regional areas attracts visitors and helps to support the social and economic well-being of communities traditionally supported by farming, but providing more income generating opportunities. Now, this investment in the NRMA charging network is opening regions to EV drivers. It's currently free to use so that people can spend their money buying a coffee from the local cafe, buying lunch from the local bakery or visiting the local trades and gift shops. So how have we progressed with building the network? Oh, there we go. The NRMA fast charges have been installed across New South Wales, supporting travel from the Queensland border through to the Victorian border. Now, since the rise of automobiles, road trips have been core to Australia's identity and a lifeline for many regional communities. Our desire for the freedom of the open road is part of our DNA. The NRMA wants to make sure that this freedom is extended to electric motoring. The NRMA charging network has significantly grown since the announcement back in 2017. And even though COVID may have slowed the roll out of the network somewhat, the NRMA fast charges have been installed across regional New South Wales major highways and now includes the Hume, the Newell, Sturt and Oxley, highways, as well as the Mitchell Pacific, Olympic and Great Western highways, as you can see in the map. And as we continue to expand, EV motorists will be able to confidently tour the entirety of New South Wales. Now, by the end of the year, NRMA plans to launch more charges. This includes launching the charger in Mudgee, which is now planned for completion by November. And we'll be extending the charges in South Australia with Berry and Tanunda, two sites, to help drivers complete their journeys onwards to Adelaide. And this is planned for completion by December. The fast charging network, it's been designed with a focus on regional areas. Our charges are about 150 kilometers apart, and that's to support most makes of EVs while allowing the NRMA to reach out to as many locations as possible within its current budget. And we're looking to expand the network further. The partnership with Transport for New South Wales, which was announced in July of this year, allows the NRMA to deliver an, at least 20 additional EV charges to the existing NRMA network. The additional charging stations are part of a $3 million co-funded investment, which once completed, as you can see on the map, will allow people to travel as far afield as Broken Hill and Burke in our state's northwestern regions. And this expansion is planned to be, to be completed by 2022. And again, um, well, since the announcement, the NRMA has also launched already three fast charges. YAS was the first charger um, launched in August under this program. And since then, we've also launched the charger in Wagga Wagga and Scone, and both of these were launched in September. Now, there will be further sites launched this year across New South Wales, uh, so looking forward to further announcements with transport in the coming months. Presently, the NRMA network in total has launched 35 sites and 42 charges. 
and that's where there's a couple of charges per site. So what does a charging site typically look like? Well, the network is currently made up of 50 kilowatt charges. Now these charges have been purchased from Tridium, who is a leading Australian charger manufacturer based in Brisbane. Each charger comes with two uh, plugs, a CCS2 and a Chatamo plug, which caters for most EVs in the market. Our data also tells us that drivers typically spend about 40 minutes at our charges, which means that um, for, from what we've seen, that batteries are usually at 45% and they charge their batteries to 80% across that 40 minute time. NRMA also buys 100% green power for its network. And so for every unit of power used when charging the EV, an equivalent amount of renewable energy is fed directly into the electricity grid. Uh, green Power is the government managed program that makes sure the energy source for wind, solar, bioenergy, mini hydro generators that produce zero net greenhouse gases. And our 50 kilowatt charges, as I've mentioned earlier, suit most EVs in the market. And we also believe that they're a really good fit for many regional communities. In terms of the future of NRMA EV charges, well, we don't believe one charger size fits all. There are some communities that will actually benefit from faster chargers. And then there are other communities and business that could actually benefit from an even slower charger. Now, as part of our partnership with Transport, we will have plans to install a couple of faster chargers. And again, these will announce when we're closer to that date. Also, the NRMA is considering additional sites which would benefit from faster chargers. And we'll announce those as we progress as well. So, what does a typical NRMA site look like? So working with our communities to deliver EV charging sites needs to make sure that we create a comfortable experience for our drivers. The NRMA is very considered when selecting a site and a site partner, and many of our site partners are councils. And we need to do this together to make sure the charger meets the needs for the driver and the community. So all our sites need to be highly visible, have good lighting, easy access to major, off major roads and two major roads. Um, they have to be a good rest stop for drivers so they can actually take a good break. Um, they need to be close to the town centre and amenities. They need to be accessible at all hours. So we don't put our charges typically within gated environments. And of course, they have to be uh, have great access to power and electrical uh, connectivity with good mobile coverage. As the NRA is building our network, we're also taking our people on this journey. So to support our members with EVs, the NRA is also undertaking a company-wide upskilling on all things EV. So we're upskilling our call centres, we're upskilling our roadside assistance teams, um, EVs still get flat tyres. Um, they also get flat 12 volt batteries because someone's left the light on in the car. I've actually done that myself. You can still lock your keys in the car. You still may need a tow um, because of a breakdown or because someone forgot to charge up the EV. Also, our Sabre Driving Schools are developing EV tra uh, training programs for schools and businesses. And also, they're soon to launch the NRMA EV Driving School. Also, we have an In the Shoes of an EV Driver program available to all NRMA staff. And this gives them an opportunity to take out the NRMA, NRMA EV out for the day and to experience what it actually means to be an EV driver using the NRMA network to charge the EV. Another important part of the NRMA is our policy team. Our policy team, just as they did back in the 1920s, lobbying for better roads, the NRMA continues to lead the conversation to encourage better EV policies. The NRMA policy team has also been leading the conversation about EVs for years now, encouraging Australian governments towards policies that improve consumer choice and lowering the cost of motoring. Now, with all major manufacturers investing heavily in electric technology in many countries and cities around the world planning to phase out combustion engines entirely, EVs are the inevitable future of motoring. We want to make sure that communities are not only ready for that, but they're ready to reap the benefits. Also important 
uh, to keep our members well informed about the world of EV, Sena Rame has teamed up with a company called EV Energy to help us inform our members about electric vehicles and what's available in the Australian market. We've launched the EV Energy platform on the NRMA website, and this is a tool to help people identify EVs that could meet their needs, including vehicle size, features, their budget, and considers the driving patterns, whether it's during your weekdays or your weekends. Each EV is presented in the tool with a view of its purchase price, the battery range, the running cost per week, which can be compared against other vehicles, and it will tell you the estimated time to charge depending upon your charging type and your driving performance. Now, you've been provided with a list of EVs that you can further shortlist, and there you have a starting point as guidance as to what's available for you in the market. Now, well, what's next for uh, the NRMA? Well, we have a charging network that's growing. We're continuing to upskill our staff on all things EV. We're working with communities and governments utility providers, car manufacturers, and other parts of the EV industry. We are going to provide more benefits and offers to our members that are EV related. We are going to create better ways to take EV road trips and journeys. And we are going to continue expanding the charging network, introducing improvements and upgrades. Uh, the NRMA truly believes that the future will be electric and will continue to be a key priority for the NRMA in years to come. Thank you. Susanna, that was um, one of the better presentations I've ever seen from a from a infrastructure provider. So congratulations on that. I mean, what a wonderful and exciting time to be in the industry. I suppose um, having having gone through and still going through a transition, has NRMA found the the steps of of moving from um, initially a lobby group and then roadside assistance and combustion engines into what is much more a sophisticated um, computerized um, car difficult there must have been new skills that were required um, much more planning and, and and a need to be able to come to grips with with some of the the nuances of that technology um, it'd be very interesting to, to hear how how nrma has has really um, taken that thought leadership step in that transformation? Well, we've, we've, we've kind of had our hands tied to a certain extent. Um, we don't manufacture vehicles in Australia any longer. Um, we're open to the imported vehicles that will be given to us. Um, if we don't show that there is an EV interest in this country, it's quite possible that we'll be given um, continuous ICE vehicles. So by setting, um, from a leadership perspective, by setting up and developing and launching a charging network, it's actually set the sign for the rest of the world to identify that Australia is an opportunity for EV vehicles to come into the country. So that was critical. Um, so that commitment was something that we wanted to make sure we we're able to deliver on. And it's not that we're saying ICE vehicles will no longer in future be available or, or will continue. We're saying that we need to give people choice and this is a choice um, starts with building a network. And certainly the skill sets that are required to build a network, it, it is different, quite different from what the NRMA has done in the past. And so the upskilling and the hiring of people, including myself and others that we have in the team are critical to the success to be able to roll out a network that has to be supported, maintained, managed and upgraded um, as it re it's required to, to be upgraded. The other piece is around upskilling our people. And that was a piece I talked about around people understanding and experiencing an EV, but also the, the training that's required to make sure that we can identify where the NRMA still plays a critical role when it comes to looking after our members. So not much really will change in terms of our roadside assistance. They will potentially have more tools to help people with, with potentially if their high voltage battery um, is not fully charged. Um, at the moment, there's towing um, that they will support and provide, and they're doing this already. Um, there'll be other tools in, in the future where they can actually help people give them a boost in their high voltage uh, batteries in their EVs and help them get on their way. So certainly it's, it's a difference about the way we do things, but it's certainly not different to, to you know, in terms of 
the NRMA moving away from its fundamental focus, which is helping our members and making sure we move people forward. Fantastic. I, having grown up with the brand of NRMA, it's such a, there's such a strong link between the word NRMA and trust. Um, I suppose, you know, one of the things that I saw was NRMA really taking a leadership role in helping educate and inform customers on their journey to um, electric vehicles and what they can expect and, and, and understand. Has that, have you, have, has that been a catalyst for um, being able to, to build a new platform on customer engagement with the NRMA? Well, certainly. Um, people look to the NRMA, uh, as you've said, we're a very trusted brand. Our expertise is in transport. So they will look to us in terms of the guidance that we can provide around the directions that they should consider and think about. Um, and certainly in, in terms of supporting our, our members and, and not just our members, it, it's anybody who has uh, a questions and interest in in electric vehicles, the NRMA is there to support them. The more people understand uh, about the value and benefits of, of driving an electric vehicle, um, obviously there'll be price parity at some point in the future, but understanding that if they make that initial investment, that they will be in a position to be able to travel with that vehicle, not just within metro environments, but also throughout regional areas in New South Wales and eventually across Australia. So it's certainly a direction that we're, we're going to continue building upon and supporting our members who have EVs. What a great news story. Now, I do just want to apologise. You'll notice on the, um, the, uh, the Zoom session that uh, Mick has unfortunately disappeared from the, the little tiles that are there. He is just working through some internet challenges at the moment and um, we are told that he will be rejoining us very, very soon. So just that, to let everyone know. Well, that's okay. Well, how about you and I continue the banter? So you've Excellent. asked me a few questions, so so appreciate that, Josh. So in terms of, um, it was fantastic to see um, the impacts of um, the DC charges um, in the network that you're identifying and the opportunity there to utilise the solar energy to help um, manage that on the grid. Um, what are the immediate um, changes that um, have been put in place or are about to be put in place by Central Energy to, to start to transition and support that type of environment? Great question. So I suppose one of the key things that we're, we're looking at is, is the interesting thing about running, running in an electricity network is energy is almost immediate. So once you generate it, you need to use it. So part of what we're looking at is, is being able to really build out three major pillars. How do we make sure that we're engaging with the communities, our stakeholders and vendors such as NRMA, to make sure we understand what they need today and in the future? The second thing is, is really be able to develop a much more thorough ability to be able to understand how the network is operating um, right down to home level. Um, it, it's surprising, but traditionally we haven't needed to have that detail. Energy got generated centrally, and then we pushed it down into the low voltage network and it got consumed. As we go forward and there's two way flows, um, largely that's going to actually need to be be able to be curated real time, which has meant a whole new um, approach and a new um, way of being able to make decisions that is very much data-based. And that is very, very exciting, but also very, very large change for us. And then lastly, we've had to learn an entirely new vocabulary. Um, mm -hmm. You know, right from what storage means to how do we actually balance and curate electricity? How do we make sure that we're bringing in and understanding what electric vehicles need, what their implication is to the network, and how we actually build that and balance those requirements with also the traditional um, requirements of our customers. It's been a 
a challenging journey. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we'll be there for a while. But, um, you know, I think John Cleland's done a remarkable job of being able to build a skill base um, that, that has allowed for fundamental change in the organisation going forward. So it's exciting. Thanks. And you're absolutely right. Um, there are changes afoot, um, probably as you and I are speaking here, about what we're wanting to do, what we believe is going to happen in the next six months. And, and yet um, there might be even greater changes within the next six to 12 months. So certainly something that's keeping us all on our toes. And, and, and I think this is where, from a collaborative perspective, it's important that many of us in our various industries that we work in, that we come together um, and collaborate to work out what we can do um, and see what we can do to try and perhaps um, not be the follower, because certainly Australia is a follower in this is instance. We're a little bit behind the eighth ball when it comes to EV charging. Well, and I think this is, it, it's interesting. Um, before Essential Energy, I, I lived over in China and worked for State Grid for a while. And what you, what you saw over there was really a merger and a, um, a collaboration of multiple industries to be able to deliver energy in different ways and in new ways um, to support everything from electric vehicles. China has one of the biggest electric bus networks. And all of those, all of those items, you can't solve that, that change or that tra tradition a transition in one company. That is from NRMA to Essential Energy to New South Wales government, all working hand in hand because society and, and, and um, the market has said that that's where we need to be in the future. Uh, and so it, it's an absolute collaboration um, and something we're looking forward to. So here's a, here's a question for you. Can EVs make electricity cheaper? I think eventually um, EVs have the possibility of making electricity cheaper. I think as we start to understand how we actually curate the, the network and be able to start to, because I mean, part of curation of the, the network, I talked about it, the, the conundrum of, of electricity needing to be generated and used at the same time. It, naturally, it doesn't store. EVs have a large battery. Um, and so being able to balance the network with those batteries and trade-offs, I think is something exciting to explore in the future. So I think it's absolutely possible. Again, it comes back to working together, understanding the data, understanding and getting a collaborative plan and then executing it. Um, the, the same can be said that they can make electricity more expensive if it's unplanned mm -hmm. um, and so part of what we've we've got as a, a, a business goal is is to bring network charges down um, we're not going to do that if we we haven't got good partners that are, are helping to support us in supporting the future and bringing those prices down and hello Mick, Mick. hello Mick well but welcome back <laughs> thank you so much um, I, I do want to acknowledge and thank both our wonderful panellists. I've actually been experiencing some uh, connection problems. And so uh, those connection issues have been, have been resolved, which I'm very, very glad of. But I do want to acknowledge that Josh and Susanna um, took up, the, took up the, uh, the task extremely well. And from what I can gather, it's been an interesting and engaging conversation. Look, we do have a couple of questions. So I thought I might just jump jump back in and, and ask a question. Um, uh, and, and one of them that's come through and, and possibly, uh, Susanna, you have addressed this, but uh, John has asked, do you envisage mobile charging as an NRMA support services uh, in the same way that uh, internal combustion engine cars can get petrol or their batteries charged? I know you've mentioned this, but to, to rejoin, could you just go take us through those NRMA services? Yes, yeah, so certainly, um, again, going back to our foundational purpose is to make sure people keep moving. So just because the vehicle changes, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, that subtly stops. We will continue to work our ways. How do we make sure we help people get out of sticky situations and if they happen to be in an EV? 
So there will be an upgrade in terms of the capability of some of our patrols will, for example, carry tools um, that will help charge um, EVs along the way as soon as those tools become available in the market. Um, the NRMA will certainly keep um, educating um, our members in terms of EVs and opportunities. We are certainly looking at a whole number of services that um, will be value adds. Um, and that is part of um, some of the strategic work that is underway. Um, and certainly we'll be sharing more of that as we, as we um, have that ready to reveal. Um, but certainly, again, it, we are not gonna change from what we do today, which is we're still gonna keep looking after our members and make sure our people are moving. Nick, I think do, you think, do you think, Susanna, that, that one of the issues that has come up is a, a mentality that, uh, and people may have heard the, uh, the Radio National report this morning, where one of the concerns as they tested an EV was this issue of range. And, and the people who made the program were talking about an anxiety as they realised they were getting close to the limit of the range. <laughs> uh, that, that, you know, and they sort of came across a, a charger as though they'd came, come across an oasis. Is it part of the NRMA's task to shift how we think about EVs and to instil a bit of confidence that there will be a widespread and very accessible charging network and people can have confidence? Absolutely. Well, well firstly, um, um, anything people are trying for the first time you know, people have to experience and then get comfortable with it. Petrol stations at the moment are, you know, engraved on our brains. It's our muscle memory. We know where every petrol station is and we've got a sense of how that vehicle drives that we drive. So we've got that comfort. Um, when you get into an electric vehicle, like anything new, um, you have to get comfortable with what the vehicle can do and what actually, when it says um, it has 20 kilometres left on, on the battery, whether in fact it really does have 20 kilometres left on the battery. Now, that comes to range anxiety. Yes, range anxiety is real. Um, I've experienced it myself. And funnily enough, I did see um, that wonderful ABC story uh, this morning and I listened and I read through um, the journey that they had to take. Um, when you know where the charges are and how much distance is left on your battery, that is gonna guarantee you a level of comfort that you'll be able to get there. Um, if the weather conditions change, um, the vehicle will have to work harder and potentially use more battery, and hence you'll see the battery um, rate diminish more so. And again, that's something about learning about your vehicle. So you will initially have to plan the journeys that um, you'll be taking and the charges along the way to help you get along that journey. And certainly the NRMA is putting in a lot of work to roll out a network to cater for those distances and to reduce that range anxiety. But at the end of the day, there is opportunity to deliver more and more infrastructure in the network. So there are more options to stop. I think the story um, mentioned that there were very strong headwinds and even though the distance that um, the driver was able to um, reach should have technically been, been made, um, the headwinds actually slowed the vehicle down and had to use more power. And so the stop had to be made sooner. Luckily, um, and it happened to be an NRMA charger and YAS, that was available for this particular person to be able to roll in with comfort. And yes, it is like seeing, um, you know, gold at the end of, end of the rainbow, um, having that charger. Again, I think it will come, um, that range anxiety is, is improving, um, but again, there's opportunities to close many gaps across um, the roads that we travel with more charges. Just a question that has come in, Susanna. Will, NRMA charging stations only be available to NRMA members? Oh, great question. Well, their NRMA um, EV charging stations are available to everyone at the moment, and they're available free of charge. And that was, if you recall, part of the initial commitment that the NRMA made. We want people to uh, in, um, experience regional areas that they haven't experienced before with their EVs. We want them to charge their EVs once they arrive, and spend time in the town, spend a bit of money buying a cup of coffee, having a lovely meal, exploring the town. So we want people to get used to using the network in that sense. There will be a point in time though, um, that we will be asking people to pay for use on our charging network. Um, at the moment, the plan is um, to keep it free for members beyond that period. We'll, we'll 
provide more information in terms of the timings around that activity uh, in the future. But at the moment, the network is free and available to all to use. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, Josh, I'd like to come to you with a question now from John. Um, and he writes, with the growth of electric vehicles year on year, will our grid infrastructure need investment or are there smart technologies that will complement this growth? At the moment, I, th I, th I think the answer is, is, is like many things, the, the answer is going to be somewhere in the middle. There are going to be areas that we will absolutely need to upgrade. Um, and we'll work with charging infrastructure providers to, to make that happen. But we've also done a, a number of planning activities to, to forward look, and we've actually built a, a working group where NRMA and other large charging infrastructure providers sit on that um, committee, where we jointly plan infrastructure. And part of what we're trying to do in this is make sure that where possible, infrastructure is, is planned jointly with infrastructure with our infrastructure to avoid us having to upgrade um, going forward. The reason for that being is, is that everyone wants as broader charging infrastructure as possible to avoid range anxiety. Um, and we also want to make sure we're doing it in a way that um, make sure that um, essential energy doesn't need to invest in infrastructure that's not necessary to support that infrastructure. Um, so there will be times where we need to and they'll be case by case. We're doing everything in our power to make sure that we're, um, we're planning to utilise the infrastructure we have. Thank, thank you, Josh. Look, uh, another question for you, Susanna, and it concerns whether does NRMA use green energy at its charging stations? Okay, so all our charging stations are actually um, connected to the green power. So we buy 100% green power, which is a renewables uh, energy source. Um, and that is something that the organisation pays extra for. It is um, a funded, it is a federally funded um, activity or initiative, which means that all the energy that's used as part of um, the screen power is guaranteed to be from a renewable source. Okay, great. Now, um, Ron Brown has a question, a general question for you, Josh, and he'd like to know, is essential energy moving from distribution to generation in solar and other renewables? Not at, not at this point. Um, I think, like NRMA said, really where we can, we're going to leverage our core competency. Our core competency at the moment is in electricity distribution. We've done it for a long time very well. Um, what we want to do is, is make sure that we're providing the infrastructure to make it seamless from renewables that are coming on and being connected to our network um, to those parties that want to consume that electricity. Um, that's a very big job in the near term and we want to make sure that we focus on doing it very, very well as we go forward. So no, we're not going to move into renewable generation anytime soon. Um, we just want to make sure we've got the right infrastructure in the right place um, to support the future. Thank you, Josh. And just on that, there's another question that's come in that I'll, I'll also ask you, Josh, and it's about whether technologies, um, are there to technologies that can be deployed at home? Um, with regards um, charging, absolutely. So the charging infrastructure, a large portion of um, EVs will supply charging infrastructure as well. Some EVs will just plug straight into the, the power point. Um, we are working with a number of parties to, to see whether or not there's smart charging that could be made available. And the reason for that is, is that where possible, um, we want to make sure as parties are charging their, their cars at home, that that charge is, is balanced at points where the network um, uh, is not constrained. Um, that takes, some, that takes some smarts from a technology point of view and, and we're working to try and make sure that that, that can be utilised in Australia. Again, that just means that we're not investing in infrastructure we don't need in the future. 
Th thank you, Josh. Um, Susanna, there's an interesting question here that's come in. Are there any um, four-wheel drive, four-by-four four EVs on the horizon for Australia? Um, so I'm not an EV um, expert, um, so I'm not sure exactly what all the OEMs will be actually delivering to Australia, but they are being developed. Um, funnily enough, Ford, um, I read the article about Ford, who are going to um, name their latest 4x4 a Mustang, which will upset a few people who may drive the two-door Mustang. Um, but they are actually creating um, vehicles that um, are, are those larger vehicles um, and getting very clever in terms of the battery technology that's used in those. Um, you can look at the um, NRMA itself in terms of our fleet. So if you think about um, the patrols that we have out on the road and, and those patrol vans, we ourselves are also looking uh, for suitable vehicles that um, are big, um, can carry um, the weight of the gear that um, our, our patrols have to carry. So we're also going through the exercise of exploring what vehicle will be available in Australia at a reasonable price um, so that our people can also do their work. But yeah, I hear that they're coming. Okay, look, I'd like to stay with you for the next question and it's come in from Anthony. And he asks, is there legislation to protect access to charging stations, for example, during big events? Oh, that's an interesting question. So if you repeat the question again, well, I, the, what I have, I, I've got, I've, I've asked as much as I've got, so we can add live, I suppose. But, but basically, the question is: Is there legislation to protect access to charging stations, for example, during events? Now, I'm wondering there whether, um, if if there was an event in a particular place and there was a large number of EVs, whether there would be some kind of uh, regulatory system to make sure that everyone had had access. Ah, I understand. Uh, that, that, that's me speculating, I must admit. And, and I do apologise if, if, um, if Anthony wants to, to write a fuller question uh, that elaborates a bit more, that'd be terrific. Well, let me try and answer what I think um, Anthony could be asking. And Anthony, please um, don't hesitate to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so in terms of legislating who can use a charger where and at what time, no, there, there's nothing like that in place um, currently. The chargers are actually installed on, on public land and, and the NRA, for example, we will have an agreement with the council who will give us the land who, where we can put the charger on that land and allow access um, for all. Um, Maybe the question you're asking uh, about also is about queuing. So how do we make sure that people aren't, um, you know, having to queue behind charges um, or people um, hanging around parking the vehicle longer than they need to? So there's certainly um, capability out there to uh, apply through an application, the ability to notify people that um, it's time for them to move, the vehicle's been charged, um, and there are certain um, examples um, overseas in, in countries where um, people are actually being penalised um, if they're actually um, staying in the charging um, or in the parking spot where the charger is for longer than that they need to. I kind of liken it to childcare. You know, you've only got five or ten minutes before they start charging you um, extra to help hurry you along. Look. The NRMA um, is looking at uh, capability and will be looking to introduce something um, equivalent to that. Um, queuing is not a huge problem on our network at the moment. We're seeing a few locations where they're getting really popular. So Mittagong, um, Sydney Olympic Park, where our charges are. Um, and there will be a point in time where we're going to have to address how do we manage that scenario. Um, but hopefully, uh, hopefully that's helped Anthony in answering the question. I don't know whether Anthony's come back with a, um, a thumbs up or a no. <laughs> well, 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 interestingly, the, there is a, a one further line, and Anthony has written that it actually relates to a non-EV event on council land in Queensland, uh, which I, I gather was for a triathlon. Um, so I don't know if that, that clarifies it. But, uh, but, but I want to thank Anthony for responding. That, that's really great. Now, at this point, Josh, I just want to bring you in and say, have any of these topics, uh, from your perspective at Essential Energy, uh, are they, uh, do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Because Susanna has been getting quite a few specific questions about the NRMA. No, look, I think Susanna's done a fantastic job um, in really fielding those. Um, 
as, as far as I understand, at least from a, a New South Wales government point of view, um, you know, part of the whole objective is, is to try and make um, electric vehicle charging as, as um, seamless as possible for electric vehicle owners to, to um, get charged and move on with their day and their life. Um, and I think NRMA and the other infrastructure providers are doing a great job in being able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And, and I do want to acknowledge, Susanna, there have actually been a couple of questions um, specifically congratulating NRMA for, for the work they've done. So I want to acknowledge that people have made that comment and, and to pass it on to you. There is another question from John, who's been very busy tonight. And he asks, are there plans to link the NRMA charging stations to their app so that people would know when, when charge stations are, are busy or available? No, great question, John, and absolutely something that would greatly benefit anyone using uh, the NRMA network. So we don't have that application available at the moment. It's something that we are working on. Um, and again, if you recall, when I mentioned um, the future of where um, the NRMA is going to head, part of that is to develop a capability and applications to support people when they're about to go on a journey to help them identify where to go, where the charging points are, and also tell them the availability of the charger at the site um, and, and give them alternative options if they need them. So yes, there is certainly going to be um, more news on the front in terms of the application that we will eventually um, look to launch um, to support charging on our, on our network. Thank you, John. Thank you, Susanna. Look, uh, we're coming close to time, but we do have just enough for a couple more quick questions. But I do want to pass on a comment. One of our, one of our um, participants has asked, this is all very localised, and I'm presuming that's localised in New South Wales. Can we take this information and generally apply it to the rest of the country? Oh, uh, absolutely. In terms of charging networks, um, we, we shouldn't be stopping at New South Wales. Um, we certainly, um, I, I know the other states have been doing tremendous jobs in rolling out uh, charging networks within those areas, especially along the major highways around Australia. Um, I know that our governments are looking uh, to uh, introduce greater infrastructure and are looking to look at organisations like the NRMA and similar organisations in deploying more of these services and charges around Australia. So certainly it doesn't stop at the New South Wales borders. Um, and I, I think there is great opportunity to build more of this charging network around the country, certainly. Right. And look, a sort of a follow-up question to the information that you have on charging stations. Does the NRMA have any idea of how many people have accessed their, their charge stations or, or is, is that something that you can't answer? Well, I, I can't give you specific uh, numbers. It's a numbers game, but um, we are seeing a steady increase um, in terms of charging. So um, it was obvious in April um, where um, the use of the charging stations greatly dropped. And that was obviously um, very much reflective of um, the COVID environment that we're in. But that picked up greatly. We are seeing more charging sessions on our charging charges than ever before. And giving an example where we've launched charges, well, we've put them in the ground, we've turned them on, and we're waiting to make the announcement. And before we even make our announcement, and it could be two, three days go by before we do an official launch, that charge is already being used. So it just shows, um, you know, we build them and they will come. So there's certainly, certainly is a great demand there and will continue to increase, especially when you get price parity and people can afford to buy the EVs and we're getting more of these in the country, that will just considerably continue to grow. Susanna, that's a wonderful final statement from you. And I'm going to offer Josh whether you'd like just to finish up as we hit hit our deadline, whether there's a final thought or remark you'd like to make. Look, I mean, for me, I, th I think the future is incredibly bright for country New South Wales. Um, I think we've got some wonderful partners in, in NRMA, Tesla, EV, um, EV and uh, Fast Charge. We, um, we've got a great New South Wales government that is, is making sure that that infrastructure is deployed 
um, fairly and quickly to support the technology as it moves forward. Um, and we've got a great customer base that has an appetite to be able to support this going forward. So from an essential energy point of view, we, we just see a wonderful future ahead and look forward to it. That's a fantastic upbeat way to finish. Um, look, I want to acknowledge Susanna and Josh, Susanna Barbier and Josh Harvey, for the wonderful information and the gracious style that they've brought that information tonight. I, as people may be aware, I had a couple of, um, of difficult moments from my end, but the way you two guys just carried on was really inspirational. So thank you very much. It's been great to have you as part of the Zero Emissions Iron uh, webinar series, and we look forward to staying in touch with you on this hugely important issue of electric vehicles. To, 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 to wind up now, I do want to acknowledge and thank our sponsors for whom we are incredibly grateful. Um, our principal sponsor is Bank Australia and our major sponsor, as Susanna would know, is the NRMA. Um, our community sponsors are Anova Community Energy, Light Touch, Solar and Electrical and Club Cas, uh, Club, Club Car, excuse me. Um, the ZEB EV team is Bridie Schmidt, Dr Muriel Watt and Christabel Munson. Our next webinar, number four, will be on the 3rd of November. Uh, we're going to look at EV conversions and we're going to be joined by Emma Sutcliffe from EV Evolution and also Alex Boson from EV Classic. Um, I'm Mikko Regan. It's been a real pleasure to be able to, to talk with Susanna and Josh tonight. I so hope you join us again on November the 3rd for the fourth in our eight-part webinar series from Zero Emissions Byron. But with that, I'd like to wish you all a very good night and thank you. <laughs>